Lord, we thank you so much that we can know that we can bring our requests to you. You've said that we can approach the throne of grace. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you that you're interceding for us at all times. Watch over us. Watch over our congregation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. For announcements today, uh, it is Sanctity of Life uh, Human Sunday, or Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. You, you notice uh, maybe your bulletin's a little bit different. The cover uh, has some, some different things on it, and we will be uh, talking about uh, that in our message today. There will be a council meeting immediately after uh, church in the church office there. We ask that council members would be uh, part of that. And then also again on uh, Thursday at 6 o'clock, there will be a uh, council meeting. Next Sunday, um, we're going to have several things going on next Sunday. One, uh, installation of the, the uh, new council members that were elected. And then we are going to have this intern pastor that is coming uh, for the possibility of a call. And uh, he will be uh, here during Sunday school and then uh, during the worship service as well. And I don't know, Chris, would it possibly work to have Sunday school in here and meet with him? Or... Yeah. yeah, I know you guys practice some during that time. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I would suggest everybody to come for Sunday school. Does anybody know what time? Is that before or after church? <laughs> Um, because you'll be able to, to get to know uh, this man and, and his family a little bit at that time. I think it's, it's really important um, to have you here at, at that time. Also, I'd like to, to thank those that are on the family team this, uh, this month. Uh, anchors and Life at Leroy. And I guess I can with the man in your behind you. But, uh, thank you for, for all your work this, this month. Any other announcements that should be made? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'd just like to point out um, in your bulletin this morning, there is a tin search. Maybe you can see it. Um, there's a Deep Rock Water Revival concert. Uh, so this is a, a Southern Gospel group based out of Minnesota. And then uh, I think three weeks from yesterday, so on February 12th at 4 o'clock, this is Saturday, uh, we'll be having, uh, they'll be coming uh, to share songs and testimony, um, and it should be uh, a good time uh, to, get to, get, to get together. We would encourage um, all of you to invite anybody that, that may have an interest in music. I think it'll be uh, a good time, um, like we said, to, to, for the gospel, for the, uh, the group to be a witness, to share the gospel. Um, to be a good outreach event um, in that way. Let me check what else I've got for notes here. Yeah. Um, we are asking for uh, the congregation to help out uh, some uh, for the setup and kind of the cleanup after that. And, and we had talked about this a bit at our uh, evangelism and missions meeting. This is a, a good way um, to be a part of evangelism because we do feel that that we can get people from the community, or people from, from Jacoby that maybe haven't heard the gospel or don't have a church home to come in. Um, this can kind of be uh, an, an, a way of outreach. And uh, a lot of us maybe uh, don't feel super comfortable going to the grocery store and starting our conversation and evangelizing people, but this is a way that as a part of as a church we can be, we can uh, take part in evangelism. Um, and uh, we will have, um, I think in the next coming Sundays, I'm not sure if we have a sign-up sheet yet, Oh, we do. We have, we have a sign-up sheet out back. There's different, different different ways that we can help. I think uh, the Sunday before the concert, we'll uh, probably do some things like moving the, the lectern in the pulpit and uh, and maybe setting up some chairs in the back as well just to kind of get ready for the Saturday concert. Um, and then there'll also be some uh, some opportunities to help after the concert to kind of get things cleaned up so we're ready for Sunday morning church as well. So um, be sure to stop by the table up there uh, if you uh, willing to give us a hand in that. Um, we are doing some advertising, trying to get people in the community uh, to come out. Um, we have some posters printed out uh, that are available available in the back. Um, I know Myron has been a big help kind of 
organizing where we're gonna try to put some posters up and, and get the word out. Um, but if you have any ideas or uh, no. wanna grab a poster and, and put it up, um, feel free to grab one uh, this Sunday uh, as well. Um, the last thing that I was gonna mention uh, um, is we have uh, a church Facebook page. And on that page, uh, we'll be posting, uh, or I think it's already up actually, um, just an announcement for the concert so that maybe people will, will see it online as well once they decide, decide to come. So um, if you are uh, on Facebook at all, check out our, our church Facebook page and, and you should be able to like or repost that page and hopefully reach, reach more people in that way. Um, and, and there may be more announcements on that coming up. Um, but all that to say, set your, set your calendars for uh, February 12th at four. Come out uh, and invite uh, anybody, anybody that you can think of. So, thank you. Maybe you can just take that uh, bulletin insert to it and share it with somebody that uh, you know that might uh, want to come. Any other announcements today? Now let's have our call to worship. It's taken from the, uh, the hymnal on pages 46 and 47. It's number four. It says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Psalm 96, 1, 8, and 9. Shall we begin our, our, our service here by turning in the hymnal? to 206 when morning kills the sky.
shall we bow our hearts and our heads before the Lord and confess our sins? And during this time, we have a, a silent confession of sin. Lord God, I thank you that we can be assured that our sins are forgiven because of your death on the cross. And when we think about all of life and eternity, that's really what makes a difference. And that's really the reason why we can say that Jesus Christ be praised. Lord, I thank you for promises such as Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away and nailed it to the cross. Thank you that we can be free and have peace with you because of what you've done. In Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll call on Isaiah to read scripture for us. So we stand and out of respect for the reading of God's word. Let us confess our holy Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. Ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time we'll call on the ushers to wait upon us for the morning offering. Worship team, come up and uh, we'd like to share this song with you. Um, always like to try to find uh, a new new song for Sanctity of uh, Life Sunday, and I found this one. Had it playing at home, and Ellie liked it. And when Ellie likes a song, she'll say, "Hey Siri, put it on repeat." Right? And uh, <laughs> we hear it all day long, um, and it got me thinking of. This is from her one of her walls in her room, so I thought she could maybe, she knows this verse, so she can help me with this. Uh, Psalm 139, verse 14. I praise you because I am. 
Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. We're going to share this with you. It's called Master Plan. Okay.
Jerry Bogart.
You know, when we come to a time of having a, a message on some of the moral uh, issues such as sanctity of life and human Sunday, Seems like I, I can't get that uh, human part in there. Let's just say sanctity of life. Uh, sometimes it, it causes you to uh, have a little bit of fear and trembling because I have to admit, there was one Sunday that I had a message on a moral issue like this. There was a new couple that was, uh, I saw them walking in the door. I didn't know how they would take it. Uh, but lo and behold, uh, they came in, and that was what changed their mind to start coming to our church. And that same Sunday, there was a couple or a family that said, well, if that's what this church believes, then maybe we should find a different church. And so you have those splitting, um, yeah, you know, I just can't talk here today. <laughs> That you have those those various emotions around the, the subject there. Uh, today we're going to look at that verse, in, and Isaiah read it for us already, Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12. To rescue those being led away to death, hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who guards the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? Lord Jesus, today I pray that you would uh, help us to look at this verse. And as we look at this verse, I pray that we might uh, truly see the importance of standing up for those who can't stand up for themselves. Lord Jesus, I pray that, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit in a very real way. Let me fade into the background. And cause me to be able to proclaim your word, word with all of the truth, the excitement, and the spiritual unction that your word deserves. And we ask it in Jesus' name. The college teacher walked into the uh, classroom and he uh, had a class on ethics and, and this is what he asked his students. An ethical dilemma. A man has syphilis and his wife has tuberculosis. They have four children. One of them has already died and the three others have terminal illnesses that they're going to die from. And the mother is pregnant again. What would you recommend? So the class had a, uh, a time when they discussed it and, and voted on it. And uh, they voted that uh, she should terminate the pregnancy. And then the professor simply noted, you have just killed a whole. And I think about it for a moment or two, how many uh, children with all of their gifts and talents has this world put to death before they even uh, breathe their first breath? What have we lost? But then you stop and think about it. It's not what the world has lost and what humanity has lost, but you think about, and maybe even for Beethoven, what did he, what would he have lost? The price is enormous for the individual child, the individual unborn, that is put to death. Did you realize that abortion was the leading cause of death in 2021 last year? Worldwide. This is not just a problem here in America, but worldwide. And as we consider all of this, we need to think about it rationally rather than just having impulsive actions. And when we rationally consider this, we find that it's only sensible to protect life from its earliest point. Today we're going to think about the beginning of life. We're going to talk about the protection of life and then the protection of the unborn and ask ourselves the question, where do we go? 
from here. The beginning of life. As we think about the beginning of life, we, we consider, well, what does science say about it? And what does God's word say about it? And, and, and scientists think about it in this way. Dr. James Lamb said that the question of where life begins is really a, a scientific question. And the scientists most qualified to answer this are embryologists, ones that study the embryo. And they concur that life begins when the genetic material of the egg and the sperm join together at conception. And that's what medical schools teach in their embryology textbooks. The clincher for me is that we think about those who are pro-choice and they, their, their argument is this. The fetus is only a, a blob of the mother's flesh and she should have the right to do with it what she wants to do. But the reality is the unborn infant is not part of the mother's flesh because it has its own DNA. It's not the mother's DNA, but it is an individual in and of itself. The real choice in pro-choice is this. After having made an impulsive choice that I now regret, I want to retain the right to choose and to circumvent the consequences of that choice, even if it means killing my own children. What does God's word say? If we, we had uh, uh, these, some of these verses and some of the, the things uh, were sung, uh, probably taken from these verses, Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All of the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Or Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. We even had our own nature and soul from the time of conception. We remember what David wrote in Psalm 51, verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, my, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. David knew that he had a sinful nature that was passed on to him from his mother and father, even from the time of conception, that his soul was there, that he was a person and had a soul from that moment. We think about when life begins. And then we, we think about protection of life and, and the conscience that God has given us. And, and our conscience tells us that there are certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong. And if you go into any society, you're going to find as a general rule, whether they believe in God's word or not, these things still pretty much stay the same. That a person shouldn't steal. That a person shouldn't lie. That a person shouldn't murder. Yesterday I was reading a, a, a story and I just glanced at the first part and read a paragraph or two, but it was talking about a, a prisoner who had escaped and he had been charged with cannibalism. He went into a farmer's house, cooked the farmer, and ate him with beans. And you know, we shake our heads at that. Why? Because our conscience tells us stuff like that is wrong. God's law is placed within the heart of each and every individual. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Indeed, when the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature the things required by the law, they are a law for themselves. Even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts now accusing, even defending them. 
But you know what? Our conscience also has been tainted by our old sinful nature. And even our conscience can tell us that, yes, maybe it's okay to do this or that. And we think about how many societies have turned their back on this inborn understanding of right and wrong. Usually it's done for momentary pleasures. We, we think about the, the Roman Colosseum and how at, at times everyone would gather together and they would watch lions eat people just for the momentary pleasure of it. We think about people who murder out of anger or jealousy or others who overpower and steal or those that kill their unborn so that they can have a better personal life. Mother Teresa said this, and quoting her, any country that accepts abortion is not teaching the people to love, but to use violence to get what they want. That's why the greatest destroyer of love and peace is abortion. Yes, our conscience tells us what is right and what is wrong, and our conscience tells us to protect life. We not only think about our conscience, though, but we think about the Word of God. It doesn't take us very long, does it? We look at the Ten Commandments and we just simply see that portion of Scripture that says, Thou shalt not murder. So we turn to the protection of life for the unborn. You know, we think about uh, human life. And especially about the weakest. And what did the, those verses say from Proverbs? Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering toward slaughter. If you say we do nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? Since life starts at conception, and it's a common value that life should not be destroyed, it's our moral obligation to protect the life of the unborn, because they can't protect themselves. You know, we go to great costs at times to save the, uh, the life of wanted babies that are born prematurely. And maybe, maybe some of you have had children that were born prematurely, and, and the doctors did tremendous things to save them. Doctors are able to save now uh, children down to, and even below, the, the size of eight ounces. Think about that. That's the size of the meat on two quarter pounders. That's small. If we go to such great cost to save the life of one of babies, why would we allow the killing of others simply because their parents don't want to be bothered by them, or that it might cause a problem if they knew that they were children. So we ask the question, where do we go from here? And I honestly believe that uh, we need to have revival. Revival in our own hearts. We need to have revival in our nation. The scriptures tell us so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Is it really possible that all of us have sinned in not standing up to this? What needs to take place? You know, when we find that there is sin in our lives, sin in the lives of others, what really needs to take place is that we need to have revival in our hearts. Worldwide revival. Where there is repentance and receiving forgiveness for what has been done. The second thing is we need to be willing to speak up in a non-confrontational way. You know, when you're talking to somebody that, that maybe is has a different point of view. Have you ever noticed that if you hit one of those hot buttons, their, their temper might flare up a little bit and they might become angry or, or, or say something that is harsh? And if we come back with something that is harsh, what happens? It puts up a bridge, uh, or not a bridge, but a, a blockade that can't be bridged 
so that the conversation then is, is pretty much silent. But what does God say? Uh, a, a better way of uh, entering into a discussion when one side becomes heated. I always think of this portion of scripture that God says a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Speaking gently, knowing that that person needs not only not only to change their mind, but they need Jesus. Another thing is that we can uh, help in, in places like crisis pregnancy clinics. And this morning, I uh, they sent out a, an email with a short, just video clip. And I'd just like to share this video clip. It's uh, from the crisis uh, pregnancy clinic uh, here in, in our area in Savage Alpha Women's Center. Maybe. Uh, I can just get you guys to click on the next, there we go. You ask the question, would they be pro-life? And what does God think about a nation that has made it right to kill their unborn children even before they can take a breath? One of the most important things that I can think of, though, is praying. Most of you realize that we would go around to various churches uh, in the AFLC, and we went almost every other year to many of the churches. And uh, I have a good friend who was the pastor at the church in Kalispell, uh, Montana, and we went by this building. It was it looked like a house, but there were people protesting outside, carrying signs. And as I read them, it, it, it talked about the fact that that these uh, children were, or that these uh, people were, were asking people to pray and that this was an abortion 
And I went back a couple of years later and I said, what happened to the abortion? I don't see people protesting there anymore. He said, well, people prayed. And it was an amazing thing. It, it just so happened that there was a disagreement between the, uh, the mother who was performing abortions and one of her children, and, and uh, it was a financial fiasco that, that took place, and it just, the, the, the abortion clinic just disintegrated, and it, it no longer was in existence. And he and everyone else just attributed it to the fact that people prayed. How often do we pray that this would be overturned? I'm wondering how many of us would, would seek out maybe even just a sticker to put on our, our rear window pray for abortion. We think about the, the Supreme Court right now. They have this is this is maybe one of the, the prime opportunities in our land for this whole thing to be changed. Can we commit to pray for our Supreme Court right now that they deliberate the, the decisions of, of abortion? How long has it been since abortion has been made possible in this country? Next year it will be 50 years, if you can imagine that. And then we think about the last thing part, and that, that there is there is mercy. Live in the peace that there is mercy. I can't help but think that there might be people here today that have had an abortion or families that have gone down that road and you have to remind yourself that there is mercy in Jesus Christ. Do you remember Paul, the Apostle Paul? One of the things that he had done before he became a Christian was that he was persecuting the church, and we think about Stephen, the first martyr, and Paul was the one that agreed for him to be martyred. They came and they laid their cloaks at the feet of Paul, a sign that he was promoting what was going to be done, the stoning of Stephen. And here's what he says. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I will show mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. There is mercy in Jesus Christ for you and for others. You know, I've thought about this uh, whole thing here. And I'm not so concerned. I am concerned that, that people would uh, that maybe have had an abortion and see that it was wrong and and come to Jesus for mercy and receive the joy of that. But Jesus said that he didn't come so much for the righteous who didn't see that they needed forgiveness, but for those who needed and saw the need of forgiveness. And I thought about that. How many of us, how many of us have gone the route of murder just only haven't put our arms and hands and feet to it. Do you remember what Jesus said that murder starts in the soul with the intentions of the heart? He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable for ju to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever even says you fool will be liable to the fire of hell. How many times have I thought somebody else was a fool? 
And yet, does it shake me like if I actually killed somebody? It doesn't. So what about you? The good news is that yes, just like someone who had actually, actually put somebody else to death by killing their unborn, there is mercy. Paul, once again, simply said, this is a trustworthy saying, Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. And I think revival needs to start with all of our hearts when we consider what our life would be without Jesus Christ. You know, as I think about my life, there's not a shadow of a chance in the world that I could get into heaven apart from Jesus Christ. And yet, with Jesus Christ, there is the absolute that I am going to live with God eternally in heaven. And I pray that that's the way it is with us. Let us pray. Lord God, as we think about our lives, so many times we have failed to stand up for what is right. So many times we've maybe even hated somebody in our heart or said that they were a fool. And Lord, we don't bear a chance to God. I come to you for forgiveness. And I thank you for the promise that we find even in the children's song that we're going to sing. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And Lord God, I pray that we might, might hold on to that. And that it might be, it might be the, the rock that we stand on every day. That I am right before God because of Jesus.
Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit.